everybody. This is Corbin, the Serpent Tongue Skipwith, and I have a special guest with me today. My name is Hede Johansen from the Faroes band Tear. Thank you again for taking this time with me. Um, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So, all right, so I want to start with... So I want to start from the beginning. What was your childhood like? And what was the music like growing up for you? Um, I grew up uh, in the Faroe Islands in, um, my, the first seven years um, in, in um, a suburb of a very tiny place. <laughs> there was one, one house, uh, two houses, one for the people and one for the cows. And uh, my first um, experience listening to music was on my mother's uh, cassette player i was listening to to uh, some american country music and and uh, my favorite still is, um, the swedish pop band abba and um, i wasn't very i wasn't very um, we moved to a, a bit more crowded place later uh, i lived most of my uh, uh, life in in a place called lampa that has about i don't know 200 220 people um, in the faroes and um, I didn't actively start listening to music until I'm, I must have been 14 or 15 when I, I found uh, heavy metal for the first time. Before that, I would just listen to whatever there was. Um, and th those were, like I said, my mother's <laughs> cassettes. And, and then my brother, my big brother started listening to heavy metal and, and uh, my cousins also. So, um, and and uh, my, my uh, classmates at school, I must have been around 14 or 15. And, and the first bands were... were uh, you know, Scandinavian uh, metal bands like Europe and, and TNT and, and uh, uh, Danish DAD and, and, uh, and other bands. Nice. Um, I read, is it true that you started the first band at the age of 17? Yes, that is correct. Um, my my f friends at, at school and to me, one of my friends at school and... and um, and Gunnar also, uh, who's uh, three years younger than I am, He's, he plays bass with Tier now. We started the band when we were 17, yes. And um, it was hard to call it a band. We were, well, I don't remember if we started playing already. Maybe I was 18 before we really played our first show, but, but um, it was a difficult uh, time finding a drummer, I remember. Um, we uh, had... had um, um, a keyboard of, of some kind, you know, a very cheap Casio of some kind that had electric drums and you had like eight drum patterns you can choose between and we and you can set the tempo. We used that when we started uh, to, you know, to play drums uh, while we were um, playing along uh, on guitar, me and my friend, and Gunnar was play playing the bass. Um, once we finally found a, a drummer, um, we started playing some, some live shows uh, that was that was a great time. Uh, it was difficult finding a good drummer, and, and uh, still is <laughs> today. Fortunately, we haven't had that problem for, for some years now. Yeah. Um, so, can you tell me um, a brief history of what your band history was like until you reached the point you are where you um, and until you made the the band official, the Tia band that you're part of now? What was the band history like leading up to that band? This band that I made with with my friends eventually um, disbanded. Or well, they play together every now and then. The singer and, and my friend uh, under the same name. I suppose you can say the band still exists. But however, I moved to Denmark uh, in 1996 or seven, and I went to music school. Uh, Gunnar moved to Denmark independently of me, and and so did one of our our drummers who'd been with, with us in this first band. I got them all together and, uh, and made this new band here in Copenhagen in 1998. And I'd already been writing some music and, and trying some, some new things. Um, th this band we had before was, I suppose, hard rock uh, slash heavy metal. And, and uh, we may have sounded more like um, something from the new wave of British heavy metal uh, more than uh, we sounded like tear dust. So the insights I, I gained through studying uh, music theory um, and, and my interest in, in Faroese folk music 
kind of guided me towards what tear sounds like today uh the band we had before had nothing to do with with folk or or any anything we hardly knew that existed uh, i hardly knew it existed when i made the tear band even the band band we have now so we made our first album in 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 copenhagen in 2001 i guess it was released early 2002 and um Eventually, after two albums, we got the attention of Napalm Records in, in Austria. In 2006, they released, re-released our albums and released the new album at that time that was Ragnarok. And we stayed with them for a few albums. And now we are on Metal Blade Records in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's really impressive. I love that. Um, but I was going to say, going back to Napalm Records, what was it like for you and the band to finally get the attention of such a, a big label? Like, like, what was the process like um, how did like is there a strict schedule of of like album releases they give you, or are they really laid back? What was it like working with them? They don't really get involved in in the in the process. They kind of leave it to the bands. You know, after you sign with them, you know, you you, ha- you have uh, three or four albums to make, and you make them when you want. And they don't really get involved. They they you deliver the material to them when you have it. Um, and it, which is the same as it is today with 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 the, the record label we have. So you feel pretty free to do whatever you like. You, I suppose they sign you because they already like what you're doing, and they're not going to get too involved with that. Um, but um, my first reaction, of course, I was overjoyed when I got uh, the email. But when I saw the first <laughs> contract, I, I I thought, is that what they're going to pay us? And we, of course, declined immediately because it was just. A ridiculous amount that, that they were going to give us, and and uh, I, I remember reclined, we uh, declined their two first offers, and they said both times they said, "All right, that's it, <laughs> make your own fortune." And th- the third time they got back to us. Honestly, it was still a ridiculous offer, but we ended up accepting that, and and it was more than twice what they offered us to begin with. So uh, being a stubborn negotiator certainly helped, but. Um, yeah, suffice it to say that the financial situations for starting bands is, is not good. However, you do get on tour and you do get someone to release your albums in a very organized way. And, and that counts for something in the future. It's just hard to make your way through it financially. Yeah, um, I can only imagine. Um, so now we've got Metal Blade Records. And if I'm not mistaken, you still have, you still have one more album to fulfill correct, under their contract. Because... I know that, you that is correct, yes. To live album, which we'll talk about later. But yes, yeah, so you do one more album. Um, what's it like working with them? Is there any major differences between them and the first label? Yeah, they are a bigger and a bit more prestigious label, I would say. Um, and they have, have uh, good connections, especially in the US. So, um, and I suppose that's why we went with them after uh, Napalm. We wanted to... to um, uh, work on the U.S. market more, the North American market, uh, which is the, the biggest metal market there is today. And uh, touring it, touring there is a bit more difficult than than in Europe, as, at least for us who come from Europe. But uh, it's worth it in the long run. Um, apart from that, n- not many differences. I, I mean, they're they're very good people. That we meet them a bit more than we met the, the Napalm guys. Uh, they live in a very uh, isolated. A mountainous place of, of Austria, but, but uh, every time we go to, to the US, the someone from uh, Metal Blade comes to see us, and it's very good to, to uh, stay in, in personal contact with them. Um, they're quite good at that. Um, apart from that, n- not that much different. I mean, they don't get much involved in what we do. Uh, like I said, they probably sign us because they believe in what we do. And... Um, uh, yeah, it's just the, a fortunate fact for us that we got to a slightly bigger label, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, going to you guys' discography, like, the talent you guys have, it's no wonder. Like, t- to me, to me, it's a no-brainer that they would sign you because you're such an amazing man. And so, Thanks. yeah, again, congratulations for that. Um, so what inspired your, your guys' passion and interest in folklore and that type of subject matter? Why... Why turn to that? Uh, it's just me who has that interest. Uh, my bandmates, uh, at least back at that time, did not have 
any specific interest in, in folk music or folklore or anything like it. Um, I'd been fascinated with Faroese folk music since, since as long as I can remember. And um, I, I started uh, digging into the musical side of it uh, when I started to play guitar when I was 14 years old. And just, you know, playing along to, to folk music that I heard on the radio, that I heard, heard uh, people uh, singing. Uh, you know, in the Faroes, you, you will hear it at weddings, um, uh, at the national holiday, you know, for, for special events. And I got interested in, you know, how it's put together harmonically and, and, and uh, melodically. So when I had more after my schooling, when I had more insights in, into music, you know, I, I was fascinated by how it's put together. And, and uh, it just, you know, as, as for the historical and mythological sides, uh, you know, we, we were taught history and, and Norse mythology in school. And I remember being absolutely um, blown away by it by the first time I heard about it. And it made a huge, huge impression on me. I must have been 10 year old at the time or nine, maybe. Uh, we had a teacher who, who was an uh, extraordinary speaker uh, and uh, told stories with such... <laughs> um, he, he, he was an um, oratory talent of, of, of a different, different kind and it completely captured my imagination. And I, I, was, I was bitten by the subject till this day. So those were my passions, and I and when it came to heavy metal, you know, I just combined them all. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I love hearing about that stuff myself as well. So to hear bands like yourself um, use that subject matter, it just, as you said, it really ignites my imagination. And I it, like every song I think about, it, I think about what you're talking about, and it really is nice and colorful. So again, another great job. Um, Thanks. So while I was listening, while I was getting ready for this interview. I was listening to your 2022 live album, A Night of the Nordic House. And I want to talk about that because that is probably one of the best live albums I've ever heard. I was still today and it was just blew me away. Um, what was the process like getting, a, getting an orchestra behind you? How, how, did, how did you get in contact? How did that all come together? I have to give the credit to, to the CEO of the Symphony Orchestra. He has since retired from that post, but he contacted me uh, probably five years before uh, the, the show itself and asked me if I would be interested. I said, heck yes, sign me in. And uh, he, he then said, okay, well, you know, it costs a fair bit. We have to secure some funding. And he, that was his, his work. And uh, he, he did a stellar job of it. Uh, you know, it, this may have been the most expensive project in, in the history of, of the Nordic House and, and the Symphony Orchestra. And uh, it was, they had a third company, which was the Faroese National TV and Radio, was also involved. And our part was, you know, we already had our music, and I had the notes. For, I write all our music in notes, so we sent that to a guy who arranges, um, an Icelandic guy who arranges symph symphonic um, music, and he arranged it for the symphony orchestra. So it, it was not very much work for us, honestly. Um, it was done by other people who wanted to, to, to establish the, the project. Um, we did some rehearsing in the Faroes, first uh, alone as a band, and then with the, the symphony orchestra. My, the main job I had was first to um, make sure all the notes were correct and, and send them to this guy, um, Harald or uh, something in, in Iceland. And uh, Harald Svanbjörnsson is his name. So uh, it was really up, up um, the work of the CEO of the Symphonic Orchestra. Um, so what was it like work like? Because um, you said it was um, there wasn't too much work on your guys' part, but working with an orchestra, it must be a completely different experience than working obviously by yourselves. Was it like a surreal moment for you? Were you like, oh my goodness, like this is crazy? The show itself, yes, yes, it, it was. Um, that was. Um, really something that was the highlight of one of the main highlights of our career so far definitely and um, i several times just wanted to to <laughs> turn around and just enjoy the show <laughs> of the symphony orchestra myself um it, it was 
it just myself look you know looking at the videos from that now it's it's, it's quite something uh, i think we um, all together we did something uh, quite special and i'm very proud to have been part of it yeah uh what was the process like in choosing the the uh, the arena the crowd like what was the process in that in choosing the location the location that was chosen, or uh, the Nordic House was already part of the project, and they are oh. the only venue in the Faroes that can ha house such an event. They have the very good equipment. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, put put their um, th their know how and, and their circumstances, you know, at our disposal or at the disposal of, of the symphonic orchestra. So uh, there was not much to choose from there, that, and and the the, the um, they were part of the entire organization of, of the project. Yeah. Um, listening back, it's for you, it must be because I felt so happy that after every song, the crowd reacted. You know, it was such a, and for you to hear that reaction after playing each song, it just must have felt amazing for you. It was. It was. Um, people were extraordinarily positive about it. And um, it was a very uplifting experience for us as, as well as for the crowd, as I understand it. And, and, uh, and yeah, just good times all around. Nice. Um, so I was wondering, is there anything you can tell, like, I mean, is, is there anything in the early stages that you can tell the audience and me about, about the, about, your, about the next album coming up? Can you guys? Um, we've uh, recorded uh, large parts of it, drums and uh, most guitars, some bass, vocals, choirs, and and uh, I have the project on my computer in front of me right now. I'm editing uh, some bass recordings. Um, it'll be a bit shorter than the last one, but most albums are, so that's not saying much. I, I don't think I will give away any details quite quite yet. Uh, things may change, and and um, and um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I like the suspense, you know, I can't wait for the next album, so I'll be one of the people on the edge of my seat waiting. Um, you know, speaking about live concerts, you've also had, you've also done some pretty amazing festivals from what I've read. You did the Ragnarok Festival in 2007 and 2009. Uh, what was that like? Can you tell me what the experience was like there? Um, that's a very good festival. I think we played it even one time after that uh, I think we played that three times but I'm not 100% uh, certain um, it's a it's a in the winter if I remember correctly it's an indoors festival in a hall in, in um, uh, I don't even remember the, the name of, of, of the town it's in Germany and that's a very nice uh, festival I remember particularly they have extraordinarily good meat on sale and um, I tried to find out where they get their meat from, but they wouldn't tell me. Um, I, th I think it's Polish. Um, but um, yeah, we had, we had some very good times there. It was very good shows together with, with some of our friends fr from uh, German and, and Finnish bands. Um, that, that's a nice one. Um, and also, also, you toured alongside Elstor. Is that correct? 2009? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Yeah. So what was that like with them? Lovely blokes, a lot of them. Uh, love them to bits and um, wouldn't mind meeting them again soon. Uh, they're a very uh, silly bunch. You know, their music is, is, uh, is a bit um, intentionally uh, silly, at least compared to ours. I, I suppose we're a bit uh, more serious and, and, uh, and self-absorbed. <laughs> but... but uh, Chris has, has a wonderful humor in his songwriting and, and uh, I love it. Yeah. And for me, the other big thing that I, that I found out was also you guys talked with Amon Amara in 2010. That must have been crazy because as far as that, like for me, when I was a teenager, so 10, 15 years ago, Amon Amara was, was the leading band for Viking metal to me at the time. That's what, so to talk with them must have been a pretty big experience for you. I'd never heard of them before we toured with them. It must have been our second tour ever. It was with Winter Sun and Amon Marth. And um, 
I, I knew neither band before we started. And I remember particularly, I couldn't stand uh, extreme vocals. I, I never listened to any bands that, that uh, used extreme vocals. But at the end of that tour, they, they had really grown on me. And, and those two bands are today probably my favorite bands ever, uh, of modern bands, um, certainly. And uh, I've started doing some extreme vocals myself recently. Um, for reasons that had nothing to do with the bands, uh, that tour was not very good or, or pleasant experience for us. But uh, I've stayed in, in contact with Yari uh, ever since. And um, I'm in occasional contact with the, uh, the guys from uh, Amina Marth as well. So looking back, it was quite something. But at the outset of it, I, I uh, had no idea what I was getting into. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you, you said it was your second tour ever. Correct. So. Yes. Would it be, yeah, yeah, just for your second tour to be with those guys, this would have been like kind of a mind blowing experience. If, if I had known what I know now, yes, it, it would have been, but I didn't. So I wasn't impressed at all by when, when I saw those names. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wasn't into the, the uh, death or, or uh, mel melodic death or extreme scene at all. I'd never heard of those bands. I, I didn't like the kind of music. So, you know, I wasn't impressed at all. I would have wanted to go on tour with, uh, I don't know, Judas Priest or Europe or TNT or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, but like I said, I, I, I love those bands and, and their music now. Yeah. Um, so the question I have for you is, in your opinion, what band, what band has come out recently, um, if you had to choose on what band that came out recently, would you choose to be, would you consider the next, the next big Norse Viking metal band? to come out like is there, is there any band that really strikes your attention I, I can't say that I keep up very well but um, there's there's a Danish uh, singer called uh, Mishkur uh, I suppose she calls her band Mishkur and uh, she made a folk metal uh, or it's not even metal she made a folk album that's called Folkasanga and um, it's really really beautiful uh, but I suppose the, these bands like, like um, Mishkur and, and uh, the other um, Danish, Norwegian, German um, project, what's it called? Heilung, you know, they, they rise pretty quick and, and they're more, the music is more atmospheric, more, more cinematic, and their live um, concept is also in that direction. And looking at the rate at which those bands gained popularity, I think they might take over that scene. Um, not really my cup of tea, but um, uh, not, not bad at all, not bad at all. Yeah. Um, so next question, next question, are you familiar with the band Ren Marabou and the Berserkers? Repeat that, please. Ren Marabou and the Berserkers. Never heard, heard of them, no. They're a Viking metal band. And um, I'm actually doing, so, I'm, so I do a metal podcast with the lead singer of this band. He's from Ireland. And um, mm -hmm. he, he, um, he told me that you guys are his biggest inspiration for doing his Viking metal, his Norse metal. So That's very good to hear. Yeah, so he wanted me to tell you that, yeah, you're his biggest inspiration. And, um, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, you influence so many, you must influence so many people over your, over your, um, like, over your career. And, you know, most bands, I feel some bands, the longer they go, kind of the, the more they can't keep up with their earlier stuff. But here you are, 2022, with one of the best live albums I've ever heard. It's just amazing how you've kept throughout your whole career from what I've listened to, you've kept that consistency. And I don't know how you do it, but it's a real skill. And, you know, you, you guys have one of the best discographies I've heard in years. Thanks. I suppose I'm, I'm a, a perfectionist, a control freak, um, asshole to work with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
nah, you know, yeah, I mean, those kind of people get the best results, I feel, you know. I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm very glad you like it. Yeah. Um, all right. So to end this off, the one thing I want to ask you, it's, it's a question I ask everyone I interview, and I just love to see the reaction. So my question to you, in your opinion, what's the most underrated and overrated album of all time? Um, uh, you want two, two answers there. So underrated. Um, I would say uh, TNT, a Norwegian uh, band with, with an American singer, uh, an album called Intuition. It should be up there with the very, very best metal albums of all time. Uh, it is completely uh, unknown. Um, overrated. Uh, uh, th that's that's more difficult. Um, there's, uh, I could, uh, I could mention some older stuff that's very famous that doesn't impress me, but you have to see it in in the in the time that it was made. If you compare, for example, early Deep Purple to early. Uh, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin had absolutely no musicianship. They just had charisma, and and um, if if I if I listen to Led Zeppelin today, you know, it just doesn't impress me at all. I think it's sloppy and and uh, and poorly produced, poorly uh, executed. Although the songwriting itself may not have been so bad, but compare that to the musicianship of the Purple at at the same time, which is absolutely stellar, holds to this day. So, Led Zeppelin is a band I, I think is overrated, uh, and I can't mention one of their albums to save my life. Yeah. Well, here you go. You, you're the first to mention Led Zeppelin. The most common <laughs> answer for overrated is the Black Album by Metallica. That is one of the best metal albums of all time, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Times have changed. Um, all right. So, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much again for taking time out. Um, I will, uh, so I will send this to you when it's all ready and done. And um, yeah, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for doing this. This was a very nice interview. I think, well, well, I really hope you liked it. I will, I'll be talking I, to you I soon. I did. I did. All right, cheers.